G'day, chaps. T is I, Clampatcher139. Out of all the Arkham games, I'd say Arkham Knight has the most mixed selection of interview tapes. A decent number of them don't give us any lore dumps or explanation of events like the previous games, making them effectively useless aside from letting the actors go off for a bit. But at the same time, we have some of the most lore-dependent and emotional tapes of the entire franchise. It's kinda ridiculous how big of a disparity there is. Don't believe me? I'll show you, as I break down every single audio tape from Batman Arkham Knight. Let's get this auditory experience started with Deacon Blackfire. Despite having six tapes, by far the most out of the entire franchise, there isn't too much information to grab from them. They're all just Jack Ryder's investigation over the course of about a month that gives context for the Lamb to the Slaughter mission. Essentially, Blackfire's army came from Gotham's homeless population. Citizens noticed that the homeless numbers were slowly decreasing over the weeks, but nobody really knew how or why. They were all fleeing to the sewers where Blackfire was amassing them into his cult and making sacrifices. He was working his way up to the final sacrifice, which is the big cult thing where everyone claims they're immortal, but they all die anyway because cults are crazy. And the reason it takes place at the Lady of Gotham is because it has some connection to a different Blackfire from who knows how long ago. Apparently, he had a cave under it where he was killed, so this Blackfire was trying to honor it in some way. I don't know, man. Cult logic. I doubted him too once, and then I saw it. The blood is his power. He bathes in it, and I'm sure he does. In the end, it doesn't matter because Blackfire and Jack Ryder are ultimately irrelevant to this story, and literally none of it matters because it was lazily thrown in at the end of an eight-hour long campaign. Except there is one interesting piece towards the end. Ryder says that Cash found connections dating as far back as the 20s, but Cash thinks they must be some sort of mistake. Cash ran this guy's prints. Turns out he's got a past. Tax evasion, fraud. One file dates back to the 20s. Cash thinks it's got to be a mistake. Now, the reason that's interesting is because it actually gives us some hints about a time period. Hopefully most of you know that the Arkham series does not take place in a set time. It's meant to be timeless, so the developers have never given us an exact year for anything. We only know dates in relation to one another, hence why we can make a timeline without ever getting a year to place anything. The only hint we've ever gotten towards a date is the dedication plaque for Arkham City, where it says it was opened by Mayor Sharp on November 19th... something. The only thing you can make out for a year is a 1, meaning it likely opened in the 1900s. That seems absurd, because it means that every game takes place in the 90s or earlier. At the absolute latest, that means Arkham City takes place in 1999 or 2000, since it was opened about a year before the event of the game, Asylum in 1998, Origins in 1990, and Night in 2000. And remember, this is the latest they can be. This checks out with Cash's assumption, though. Even assuming the worst for Deacon, let's say he's about 80 years old. That would mean he was born and immediately gained a criminal record if he was active in the 20s. It just doesn't check out, which is why this time period makes sense. Too much earlier, and it's theoretically possible. But if it takes place right at the turn of the century, there's no way that file would make sense, explaining Cash's confusion. It still doesn't give us a concrete date for anything, and technically still leaves a good 20 years the time could be taking place, but it's at least something. Which is more than you can say for literally all the other tapes, so I'll take it. Next, we move on to Harley, and unfortunately, they're just a complete deconstruction of their attack on the movie studios. I say unfortunately because it's showing how little she actually did for the attack and how much she relied on Henry. At the very least, it starts with a darkly comedic look at their first meeting. As we know, Henry's Joker trait is the brains, which means it knows how to conceal itself until absolutely needed. He got in contact with Harley for a much-needed family reunion, then later unveiled his Joker side and essentially showed that Harley will follow anyone who can make a good joke. What's red and black? A baby under an anvil. Tape 2 is an interview with Batman, showing that Henry was in Batman's custody as early as specifically October 15th, meaning he was missing for a good two weeks and that there was a little bit of time before that where he met Harley. Henry lets his Joker side slip out a little bit during this interview, as he's baffled by the fact that there could be other Jokers just like him. Their blood was contaminated. Like yours. What? I mean... 
I'm not the only one. And then he suggests to Batman that they should kill them rather than trying to find a cure. Ironically, suggesting the same thing Hallucination Joker would suggest to him later. We're in danger, Batman. You can't risk that kind of evil escaping into the world. You should kill them. All of them. It's the only way to be sure. It's actually kind of funny that all the signs were there that Henry wasn't quite right. But Batman just couldn't pick up on them because, I believe anyway, he had enough hope in there being a cure that he was blinded to the facts right in front of him. The last tape is Henry's confirmation of the jailbreak with Harley, which really just brings into question how he was able to smuggle a walkie-talkie and use it to talk to Quinn without Batman or Robin catching on, but whatever, suspension of disbelief. Mrs. Q, this is Mr. J. Come in. Over. Leave me alone and clear, Mr. J. My infiltration remains utterly flawless. Operation Pudding Break is a go! In the end, it just shows that the jailbreak wasn't Harley's idea, but Henry's, and shows how little initiative she was putting in. She didn't even want to go through with it because she had to smack Henry upside the head with her bat. Again, not too much we didn't already know, just kind of reinforcing that Harley hasn't really been herself since Arkham Asylum. You do want to kill him, don't you? Yeah, okay! Ooh, after that, Bird Boy's coming. See you soon. Mr. J, over and out. Next, we have a tape from Joker of all people. Isn't he dead? Where did this come from? Well, it's really just a monologue from Batman going over the events of the main trilogy. He recaps Arkham Asylum and City, then goes over what needs to be done in Arkham Knight. There's not much of note except that he says Joker's blood behaves like a prion infection, which further emphasizes the bad blood theory. Joker's mutated blood behaves like a prion infection, attacking the brain and transforming these people. I swear, I get more and more evidence for this thing every single video, chaps. If you care, you can look it up. It's a bunch of science I don't have time to explain away right now. But one of the first examples listed with it is Mad Cow Disease, which sounds awfully similar to Mad Clown Disease, don't you think? If Henry wasn't immune to Mad Clown Disease, then that means there is no cure after all. Just know that I didn't listen to this tape when I made that theory, so I was just right. Next up is Penguin, which is once again less him and more a bunch of villains. Because this is the meeting Scarecrow called that Ivy talked about. Unfortunately, we don't get too much from it. It's really just Scarecrow introducing the crew to the night. Well, well, about time you showed your face. Yeah, what's left of it? What's the deal, Crane? Why are we here? And that's literally all we get before the tape cuts off, sadly. I really would have liked to hear what the other villains think of the night firsthand rather than snide remarks after the fact. Tape 1 is more just showing the relationship the villains have at this point, which is fine, but we kind of already get that from the rest of the series, so was this really necessary? Tape 2 shows what shaky terms Penguin and Two-Face are on right now. They only agreed to Scarecrow's ceasefire because it means they might kill Batman, but as soon as that's done, they're going right back to each other's throats with no remorse. You just make sure our men are armed and their guns are loaded. Oh, don't you worry, Arv. The guns will be loaded. Every bleeding second of this truth. This rivalry, of course, stems from their turf war in Arkham City, where Two-Face took over the museum and Bowery after Batman took Penguin down. Oswald really holds a grudge, huh? Tape 3 shows even more how loose their terms are. A goon with a broken arm is relaying to Penguin that some plan of theirs failed, which I can only assume was some kind of sting at the docks to take out a few of Harvey's men. The Arkham Knight got word of this operation and broke it up, killing everyone as punishment for breaking the truce. Hey, don't shoot the messenger, right boss? Nah, I could break his bloody arm though. It's nice that this shows how much Harvey and Oswald wanted to kill each other after what happened in Arkham City, that even under the agreement of killing Batman, they're still in a turf war. But it doesn't add much we didn't already know. We know they hate each other from their interactions getting locked up and Penguin's monologue early in the game. Then we killed Dent and the others, right? Two-Face killed my brother back in Arkham City. He should be dead, not Robin Banks. Now that's not very nice, is it? You don't pay us to be nice. <laughs> Give that man a cigar. Of course we're gonna kill that ugly, twisted son of a bitch. We're gonna kill them all, lads. We didn't really need these, but I 
guess it's nice hearing their performances again. Our next batch of tapes are from Professor Pig, which are just... really, really weird. The others I can at least look to the rest of the game's lore to understand, but Pigs don't give me too much to go off of because he has so little lore to him. The first tape is just a fun little advertisement for the Circus of Strange. There isn't anything there to interpret because it's literally just an advertisement. Everything's meant to be taken literally. Be astounded by Big Top. Is it a man? Is it a woman? Who knows? But I guarantee it's the most gigantically grotesque assortment of flat you have ever seen. It can be assumed these ads were played in the places Pig would eventually abduct his victims from, though can't be assumed any of the victims saw them because we don't even know if they ever went to the circus themselves. The second and third, though, are just... really freaking creepy, man. Because they're tapes meant for his yet-to-be-born son, Janosch. The first is just a breakdown of information we already knew. He uses a circus as a front to kidnap people and turn them into his dolatrons. He just stretches that information out over a very long period because, I mean, he's feeling very eccentric, I guess. The climax of the show is when I take them to see Mother. Oh, I tell you, they are amazed by my imagination, confounded by my dexterity, as each is transformed into a beautiful work of art. And the last tape is just flat out disturbing even though I honestly can't understand any of it. From what I can gather, Pig is trying to tell his eventual son how he was conceived, I think, and I honestly can't understand what he's going on about because he's just so set on using as many metaphors as possible. Like an angel, she swept into my turvy world, dragged me, screaming, <laughs> from shapeless chaos, and wrapped me. In her arms. And frankly, I don't want to get into the possible interpretations because I have a feeling any more talk of this topic will get me age restricted. If you're really curious about it, you can listen to the tape yourself. Just be aware that there are very heavy grape without the G implications. You've been warned. I had to end the alarm. For you. For mother. She left me no choice. So let's just move on to Riddler and get back to laughing for a bit. Please and thank you. Edward's first tape has heavy Arkham City vibes, as it's basically just Scarecrow recruiting Eddie to his cause, but also kind of psychoanalyzing him like Strange did previously. This first line is just gold. I know what you're doing, Crane. Talking to me away from Cobblepot and the others. You're appealing to my ego. Is it working? Ha! I don't have an ego, Crane. I'm far too brilliant, especially for the likes of you. The tape shows that Riddler didn't want to work with Scarecrow, but did so reluctantly after Crane actually did his job for once. Crane actually delves into Nigma's fears to manipulate him to his side, which is something I really wish we got to see more of because this is honestly fantastic. But what if you failed, Edward? What if, by some underhand means, of course, the Batman were to humiliate you again. Absurd! This is what Scarecrow should be more like, not necessarily using fear, but understanding it and manipulating people with it. It shows how good of a villain Scarecrow could have been if they just, if you'll pardon my slang, let him cook. I know, Edward, it's a frightening thought. How many failures can even your enviable reputation withstand? But if the Bat were distracted, tugged in too many directions by too many threats, why, then you would be assured of the upper hand. But back to Riddler, he does eventually concede and agree to attack with Crane and the others, which leads to the events of the game, of course. Tell me which day you plan to attack Gotham, and maybe, just maybe, if you're lucky, I will coincidentally put my entirely separate and superior master plan into effect. The second tape is a quick call with Catwoman, giving us a bit more insight as to how she got herself caught. He calls her up with a job offer, she agrees, but only after insulting him, like, a lot. It's great, I wish we got to see more of these two together. No, 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 listen. I need something acquired, something valuable. 
sorry, Eddie. It's just that I have all these clients who aren't insecure little power-mad man-children. I mean, we technically do in the third tape, as we get to hear the exact moment Selena was captured. We enter with Eddie working on a Riddler bot, and Selena eventually entering upon its failure to power up. More back and forth ensues as Riddler tells Catwoman what he wants stolen, then lures her over to the bot, which presumably puts her in a bear hug and considers her trapped. Now, <clears throat> give my creation life! Ah, damn it! Useless hunk of dead metal! Do you want to become a semi-automated theme park mannequin? Because that's the fate in store for you! One thing I'm iffy on is when this takes place, because it could be any time between the game and the weeks leading up to it. We know thanks to Arkham VR that just before this, Selina was traveling the world stealing the most valuable artifacts. So it couldn't have been that long before the events of Night, since Bruce has very recent postcards in the lounge. It also implies that Riddler didn't get his robots working until very close to the events of Night, which is very strange to consider, especially with the massive factory we see in Catwoman's Revenge. There's a lot of weird information on these tapes, but I'll assume the defective bot was just a ploy to drop Catwoman's guard, and this took place the day before Arkham Knight. That would give Selina time to get back to the States, if she was still out anyway, and for Edward to lock her up for Halloween the following night. Why you... yes. <laughs> In a manner of speaking, anyway, I'm depleted. And always compensating for it, too. <laughs> oh, Catwoman, your wit never ceases to... occur. Next, we take a look at Simon Stagg, but like a lot of other characters at this point, it isn't actually him, but rather his business partner, Dr. Alex Sartorius. He's doing the classic, unaware business partner confessing to the company's crimes while drunk as a skunk bit. I keep thinking someone's gonna barge through the door at any moment. The scotch probably didn't help. <laughs> and there isn't too much we couldn't glean from context clues throughout the game in the first tape. Just this guy going through the usual spiel about how he was a good scientist trying to make the world a better place, but Stag got greedy and changed the company's business model to focus on something deadly. What else is new? I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Jeez, <laughs> anti-anxiety meds, they, 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 they rattled your brain. Tape 2 is just him getting far more intoxicated and telling us that they use human testing for their biological weapons. Unethical, of course, but that nobody would miss the subjects. Sounds an awful lot like a certain other mad scientist from previous games. Where was I? Oh, yes! Chemical weapons, biological weapons, ah, oh, wonderful things. We went into business to save people, but it turns out that killing them paid better. Not well enough for Simon, though. That greedy, grasping parasite, that bastard! The only interesting thing to come from the final tape is that Sartorius claims to have developed a mass inoculation device. They're taking my technology, my mass inoculation device, and they're turning it into something twisted, something wrong. Inoculation being a fancy way of saying immunizing through repeated vaccine doses. It can be heavily, and I mean very heavily, assumed that this is the basis for the cloudburst, primarily because of the mass part of that description. Aside from that, there's nothing else. It's just your classic story of unaware business partner finally snapping and trying to confess. This confession will be my epitaph. The proof that I was not content to weigh the good I've done against the evil done by him anymore. If you were listening to this, Dr. Sartorius, Mr. Stagg would like a word. Before we get to the final two tape recipients, we can actually take a look at some secret tapes you can find after completing the Season of Infamy DLC. There's one for each character, so let's start with Mad Hatter. Unfortunately, there's nothing lore-wise we can glean from this, as it exists purely for comedy. And, yeah, it's pretty damn funny. I give the orders here, not you. And you'll have three dead cops by the time I'm through. <laughs> See about that. Now quit with the rhyme. Then let me talk to the bat, and I'll confess my crime. The only thing we can really get from it is that this interview was taken moments after Jervis was arrested before Cash told Batman about him, because he talks about killing cops, and that's the first thing Cash tells Batman. But yeah, that's it. It's just for laughs. Talk, goddammit! Now, now, officer, you mistake me for a snitch. Where are they, you little son of a bitch? <laughs> Certainly Next we'll look at Warden Rankin, aka the guy from beneath the surface who Croc really wanted to kill. And from this single tape, I can more than understand why. 
It's a recording of one of his patients, likely one very early in his testing. He apparently gave all of his prisoners a serum in their meals that would assist in limb regrowth, assuming they got something cut off to regrow. Which is exactly what the warden does. Scalpel. What are you doing? No! No! Ah! Ah! Stay awake. That's it. Concentrate. Oh god! My finger! You cut off my damn finger! If the experiment's a success, it'll grow back. And good god, this tape is honestly so hard to listen to, man. Whoever played this prisoner did such a damn good job just screaming in agony. It's honestly some of the best pain screams I've heard outside the Saw franchise. And this was just for a single finger, which would hopefully regrow back after some time thanks to the serum. But holy shit, this guy is evil, as if we needed any more proof. Third is Ra's al Ghul, which was actually taped a long while ago, back in Arkham City in fact. It's unclear exactly when, but I'd assume just before the events of the game, since he says that Strange will activate Protocol 10 when he commands it, implying it wasn't yet ready to be enacted. Everything is prepared. The wicked of Arkham City grabble like rats at its walls. Strange will strike them down at my command. He wants Talia to bring Batman to him, because he really needs a successor. Anyone wondering why Strange wanted to die so badly? Here you go. The pit isn't doing it anymore. He's becoming more and more of a zombie every time he comes out, and really wants Bruce to take over the league. The Lazarus pit restores me less each time. My mouth tastes of rot. My mind. He sees him as an equal that could maybe be persuaded to join. But if he doesn't, he leaves the league to Talia, saying that Nyssa is just too weak. Which is actually doubly ironic, because not only does Talia end up dying before him, but Nyssa ends up leading the Rebels and eventually the League itself if you choose the good ending. Aside from that though, it's just D. Bradley Baker going off. What's more to love? The final tape is naturally for Mr. Freeze, and it doesn't give us much either, but it's frickin' cryworthy, man. It shows the minutes leading up to Victor freezing Nora, and the optimism the two had prior to cryostasis. Your name? <laughs> Victor, stop. Protocol must be followed. Victor, I mean it. Patient refuses to disclose name. Patient is about to kick ass if this goes on any longer. Victor says that he only needs a few months to develop a cure, but we all know that didn't happen. We just need a few months and I'll have a cure. Then we can live the rest of our lives. At this point, it's been years, nearly a decade inside that chamber with no end in sight. This tape just shows how much the two loved each other, how well they bounced off each other, and how desperate Victor was for options at this point. It's heartbreaking to hear this tape knowing how everything turns out. So, about this protocol, anything in there about kissing the patient? To hell with protocol. But overall, not too much from the season of Infamy tapes though I am glad they're here nonetheless. Our penultimate tapes go to the penultimate villain, Scarecrow. His first is one that really has me questioning the timeline a bit, but here we go. Jason approaches Scarecrow as the Arkham Knight, proposing an alliance to humiliate and kill Batman. To do so, he'll assemble and personally train an army, all the stuff we know he did. So when did this conversation take place exactly? Another child of the asylum set free. Tell me, what tortured soul cowers behind that mask? All we know is that it has to be sometime between Arkham City and Night. We know it has to be after City because Jason didn't adopt his Arkham Knight moniker until then. But aside from that, we've got nothing. I guess immediately following this, Jason started training the militia in Venezuela so they'd be ready in nine months to take on Batman. But if so, why are we seeing so far back in Crane and Jason's relationship? This is probably the farthest back in time we go for any singular tape. And what would you know about Batman? His fear. Very well. You have my attention, Arkham Knight. And tape 2 is just the follow-up, while also being pretty much the shortest tape in the entire series. Shit's less than a minute long, why does this thing exist? Three billion is a significant investment. 
Especially when all it tells us is how much Jason actually planned this out with Scarecrow, showing that he knew exactly what he was doing setting up the roadblocks, watchtowers, and bombs. But like, again, we see all this play out throughout the game. We didn't need to hear Jason explaining it away to Scarecrow. As they run scared, we emerge, take over his habitat. Every rooftop, road, and back alley, we draw him out of the shadows and chip away until he has nowhere left to hide. And no one left to hide behind. The third tape is the only interesting one to me, because it actually explains some stuff we don't have answers to. About damn time! More specifically, why Jason decided to go to Scarecrow in the first place, rather than just work on his own to kill Batman and move on with his life. Jason doesn't just want to kill Batman. He wants Bruce to suffer like he had. So, it's personal. Well, there are many in this city with a gift for causing harm. Not that kind of pain. The real kind. You want him afraid. And since Crane is the one villain who specializes in fear, it only makes sense to go to him. And here, again, we see the interesting side of Scarecrow, where unlike everyone else who just wants Batman dead, he wants Batman's legacy to die. He's better off dead. Kill him and you martyr him. You make him a legend. But break him, humiliate him, terrify him, and hold him up for the world to see. Then he's nothing but a man. Jason, of course, doesn't care. He just wants Batman to suffer and die. And he doesn't care what Scarecrow needs to do, as long as he gets to be the one putting a bullet in Batman's head when it's done. Again, these are really interesting character dynamics that we just don't get to see in the main game, because neither character was given the proper amount of screen time to develop these aspects. One thing I found especially interesting, though, is that Jason actually contradicts himself with this tape. He says he wants Batman to suffer, not just die. But then, listen to this line during the Cloudburst fight. Scarecrow can choke on his toxin, Batman. He wants you to suffer. I just want you dead. Jason has become so enraged at this point in the game, realizing how much of a different beast Batman has become as of late, that he wants to forgo the suffering and just kill Bruce outright. It's another great character detail that was, once again, thrown to the wayside and would otherwise have made the knight a far more compelling character. And speaking of the knight, last but certainly not least, we have my favorite tapes in the entire saga, the Arkham Knight himself. Of all characters, Jason is the least explored in this game in every respect outside of tapes. From his tapes, we get so much inside information we were sorely missing out on. And really, just some time to listen to Jason as Jason rather than the whiny Arkham Knight. Unfortunately, this is not quite the case with the first tape. Though, that's not to say it isn't interesting. We're back to Scarecrow, this time talking with Barbara. Thanks to the third tape, we know that this takes place just before the Cloudburst attack, because Scarecrow comes in at the end and says that the Cloudburst is fully charged. We can't get an exact time, but it's at least something. Who is Batman? Ask him when he gets here. Thank you, Miss Gordon. I was afraid that my preferred interrogation method would not be necessary. He goes on a long spiel about fear. What else is new? But Barbara stands her ground and doesn't give him an inch to work with. It shows how confident she is in this situation, and that her mouthing off to Scarecrow on the roof didn't come out of nowhere. She was being sassy from the very beginning. The long term damage is more severe, of course. Are you done talking? I am. You're still talking. He's about to inject her with fear toxin before the night barges in and stops him. And man, does he sound pissed. Very well. Get the hell away from her. It's only a single line, but really puts into perspective how much Jason still cares for Barbara despite kidnapping her. And this fact continues into the second tape. He immediately asks if Scarecrow hurt her, which seems out of character for this guy hunting your boss if you're Barbara, so she just assumes it's a good cop bad drop routine. No, 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 no. See, you're supposed to keep me talking. Play for time. Wait for Batman. That's what he taught you, right? I've got nothing to say to you. <laughs> but we all know it's Jason actually caring for her. 
it shows that despite how brutal he was in the kidnapping, and especially after the car crash, he was never going to hurt Barbara. But this tape also shows exactly what's been going through Jason's head all these years, and it's only now coming out because he has someone to vent it to. It's, again, really emotional stuff hearing all these small things relayed by Jason, how much he tried to stall for Batman, but Batman never came. It's genuinely depressing stuff, especially since we never get to hear any of this in the main game. This is what we were missing that could have made the Arkham Knight a fantastic character, and we just got it relegated to tapes. The most interesting line of this tape, to me at least, is right near the end, where he says that when it comes down to saving his family or completing the mission, he'll choose the mission every time. Which we know is not how this Batman operates. After Barbara is kidnapped, Bruce dedicates all of his energy and resources to saving her. When Alfred tries to persuade him to end everything and capture Scarecrow of the Night, he deflects and makes it his top priority to save Barbara before anything else, meaning he no doubt did exactly the same thing with Jason, but Jason just doesn't know it. And then we get that incredible reveal and Barbara's single reaction tells us everything we need to know. And then we come to tape three, which is, without exaggeration, my favorite tape in the entire franchise. This shit legitimately made me cry when I first heard it. It is that good. And anybody else who has listened to this tape themselves will agree with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you take anything away from this video, listen to this freaking tape. It's a solid minute and a half of Troy Baker giving one of the most emotional performances of his life. If you had any grievances about his portrayal of Jason in this game, thinking he's a whiny teenager when he takes off the mask, let this tape dissuade you. This man is one of the greatest actors of all time for a reason. Jason, this is wrong. This is justice. He left me. He lost you, and he mourned for you. Come home. He gives one of the most mournful speeches of the entire saga, relaying what Joker did to him for over a year in just a few seconds, while also showing exactly what he thinks happened with Bruce. I can't go back. You don't know what Joker did, Barbara. He hollowed me out and filled me back up with hate. Barbara was there, and she knew what happened, but Jason doesn't believe it. He's on this quest to kill Bruce now, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop him. Jason, we can fix it. I can fix it! I know now what to do. I take all this pain, all this blackness, and I put it all in a bullet, and I put it right between Bruce's eyes. But even though he believes this, he doesn't hold anything any ill will towards the rest of the family. He doesn't hurt Barbara, even when he lashes out yelling. He asks how Alfred is back at the manor, like one would ask about an old friend. And he never goes out of his way to attack any of them. Joker's dead, Jason. You want revenge on the man who hurt you? You've got one shot. Come back to the manor. Let us help you. Don't let Joker win. How's Alfred? He misses you. We all do. It is genuinely one of the most emotional moments in the entire Arkham franchise. And it's all relegated to a freaking audio tape. The tape ends with another reassurance that Barbara isn't going to be hurt under his watch, showing when Scarecrow dropped her from the roof, their deal was broken tenfold. The cloud burst is charged night and time. Someone put a gag on her. Anyone hurts her. They're dead, man. It's amazing stuff, man. And that is every single tape broken down, chaps. Thanks for watching. And as it turns out, this is also the conclusion of my tape explanation series, since, like I said, there's basically nothing I can do for Arkham Asylum. 
I hope you enjoyed this series and maybe have a newfound appreciation for all the little details Rocksteady and WB were able to put into these amazing games if you just knew where to look. I know I did. With that said, do all the YouTube stuff because I never realized how improbable so many of these tapes are to actually exist. Like, seriously, most of these are just regular old conversations. Why are the villains recording everything? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later, chaps. What's wrong? Scared. <laughs>